Hey there, I'm Mr. Terry, I'm a high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video. All right, returning back to extra history, and it's been way too long. And this video came across the timeline recently, and it's titled, The Disastrous History of the First Transatlantic Cable. All right, we were just talking about this in my AP World History class, about the power of long distance telegram lines and how it bolstered the Imperial era in the late 1800s. And I can only assume that there were mishaps in installing such ambitious projects like this. All right, the original video is down below. Make sure you give that video a view, a like, make sure you're subbed to Extra History. All right, with that, let's get started. Like I said, in the late 1900s, in kind of the age of the new imperialism, um, the invention of telegraphs and that going along uh, the line, or, uh, along with uh, railroads, really help expand empires to the biggest you know they had ever been and the most efficiently run. Um, so the transatlantic one, of course, is going to be very important. But you saw them also, like the British, for example, um, installing uh, with the Suez Canal being uh, uh, constructed. Um, the British installing uh, one basically through the Suez Canal into the Indian Ocean, uh, so they could communicate with their most important colony, India. Okay, a communication and a transportation without the Suez and without the telegram used to take months to get correspondence to back, uh, back and from, and now it'll be a matter of days or weeks. Anyway, let's look at the transatlantic, though. A cannon roars from the citadel of Calais, France, blasting smoke and sound out over the English Channel. The crowd cheers, celebrating the, the shortest point event of the channel. They've all gathered to witness because that shot has not been triggered with a gunpowder fuse, but rather by an electric pulse sent from Dover, England, okay. along a wire that's been laid along okay. the bottom of the, the narrow channel separating Britain from France. We're doing, we're, we're lighting, they're lighting guns in other countries. <laughs> I, I assume this was agreed upon. <laughs> Not a sabotage. Later that day, a return signal from Calais sets off a British cannon at the gates um, of Dover Castle. On November 19th, up. 1851, two nations are linked by an undersea cable for the very first time. The Times of London declares that this conquest over the waves must ever remain recorded as amid the greatest of human achievement. Yes. But some men are already infamy. envisioning a grander feat by asking a question. If a telegraph cable could bridge the English Channel, could one span the Atlantic Ocean? Sure. And this would make sense, right? Because, like, you know, Britain's going to want to communicate, especially with, like, Canada. I mean, any type, any, any country. But, you know, you want to connect your empire, right? Yeah. Thanks so much to Factor for keeping us history-loving beans well-fed fast. The arrival of the telegraph in the 1830s was nothing short of a revolution. For millennia, messages Instant could travel no faster than the speed of a horse or sometimes a bird. But by harnessing the power of electromagnetism, Fire messages signals. could now cross entire countries in mere minutes. And it caught on quickly. Between the opening of yeah, the first commercial no system in 1837 and the laying of the channel cable 14 years later, almost 30,000 miles of telegraph wire had been strung across Europe, Britain, and the United States. I want to know some of the logistics of like, okay, so 30,000 miles, like how many ships did they need? Uh, you know, how do they connect them? You know, all this kind of stuff. Now, news, diplomacy, <laughs> and paid for it all worked at the speed of electricity, but oceans remained a barrier. While paddle steamers and propeller ships had cut travel times significantly, it still took around 12 days for a letter to cross from London to New York. Mm. And it was that limitation that Frederick Newton Gisborne, an Englishman who'd settled in Canada, was determined to remove. A self-taught electrical engineer, Gisborne imagined a line that stretched from the west coast of Ireland to the east coast of Canada, uniting two continents by the miracle of telegraphy. Would it go through... Maybe like Iceland, Southern Greenland, you know. So in 1852, he set out on the first stage of his plan to lay an undersea cable from New York to St. John's in Newfoundland. Okay, this is a stupid question, but like could sea creatures and other stuff going on in the ocean like mess with the cable? Is that a thing? Like destroy it? I was looked upon as a visionary by my friends, he later recalled, and pronounced a fool by my relatives. And two years later, <laughs> it kind of seemed like his relatives had been proven right. His cable bought in London from the makers of the channel cable had broken on the rocky seabed. And okay. he only managed to stake 40 miles of overland wires in the frozen wilderness of upstate New York. Gisborne was now $50,000 in debt and facing prison on charges of fraud. A lot of money so back in then. desperation, he looked for an investor to keep his dream alive. And he found one in Cyrus West Field, 
a 35 year old paper magnate despite having no knowledge of telegraphy or oceanography <laughs> gisborne's vision of a trans but he had cable money would become field's obsession he began by forming the cable cabinet a group of investors scientists and engineers that's a cool name, among actually. the first members was actually samuel morse the co-creator of morse code and the inventor of the telegraph system yeah. used in the u.s inventor while gisborne was the company's chief engineer it was now pretty clear that Cyrus Field was now the driving force behind the project. By the way, a little historical context. It's going to be a little bit after this, but um, one of the, the, the big impacts we saw um, in the early years in the Western Hemisphere of the Telegraph was actually in the American Civil War. Uh, the uh, Combined with railroads, uh, the northern states had significant telegram and, uh, and, and railroad networks. But like Lincoln himself, like during the Civil War, basically had telegraph lines and tickers that could basically go right into like the Oval Office, uh, right into the White House, and basically almost like command the war you know, from DC there. Right. And then get, 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 uh, 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 movement of troops and goods and all that stuff. It was a major advantage in the civil war. By the end of 1856, That's be the 1860s. his line from New York to St. John's was complete though at the steep cost of $1 million. And Ooh. this would prove to actually be the cheapest part of the enterprise for that same year. Field ordered two and a half thousand miles of cable from two British I'd companies, even make which was loaded much. into the holds of the HMS Agamemnon and the USS Niagara, <laughs> loaned to Agamemnon. Field by the British cool. and American governments. But due to its colossal weight, King. the two warships had to share the cable between them. Tossed about on the Atlantic waves, the line broke on the first day that they set out. Oh my it was grappled up from the seabed and fixed, but broke again just days later. Dude, crappy this time, lines. With 300 miles of cable disappearing into the depths. Undeterred, no. Field tried again in May of 1858 with a new plan. The Agamemnon and Niagara would meet in the middle of the Atlantic. There, they would splice their two halves of the cable together and then set off like a back golden toward spike. Ireland and Canada, laying cable as they went. I wonder, you think it'd be hard? I mean, I know navigation techniques were getting better, but like actually finding the meet meeting spot in the middle ocean, that would be incredibly difficult. Despite better unwinding mechanisms, a violent storm engulfed both ships and the cable broke three times Dude, these before the suck. attempt was abandoned. After this second failure, many investors mulled cutting their losses, yet Field's optimism managed to keep in the too project deep. going. On July 29th, 1858, the two ships rendezvoused again and spliced cables for a third attempt. This time, the conditions were good, Yay. and the USS Niagara made landfall at Newfoundland on August 4th, and the following day, the HMS Agamemnon reached Ireland. Yay. The cable oh, wait, they had been okay. laid. Then on August they start. 16th, okay, so they went together, got to the, the center or, or the ocean and then went their separate ways. I was like thinking they met in the middle, like one started on one continent and one started on the other. 1858, the first Under official the message was sent along the line. I bet it what, what was directors it? of Atlantic USA. Telegraph Company, Great Britain to directors in America. Europe and America are united by telegraph. We are Glory friends. to God in the highest on earth. Peace, goodwill towards men. Jubilation marked the front page of and every newspaper. Bells were rung, flags flown, and New York held a parade. Heck, even Tiffany's department store sold unused pieces of the Great Cable as jewelry and decorative furniture. Dude, that would actually because be awesome. Mind, that would be an amazing collector's item. Oh, can you get those? They, they were celebrating not eBay? just a technical wonder, but possibly a new world order. Many believed that this new era of communication would usher in world peace. The laying of the telegraph cable is regarded as well. the greatest <laughs> event of the present century, said one writer. It is impossible that old prejudices and hostilities should longer exist no. <laughs> while such an instrument has been created no. for an exchange of thought between all nations of the earth. Yet, even amid the celebrations, there were actually grave problems with the cable. First off, the quality of the signal was terrible. Yeah, Queen Victoria's message of friendship to President Buchanan, sent on the first day, took 17 hours to transmit 98 words. Jeez. Worse, it was clear that the wire was already degrading. On September 1st, the same day Salt that water, parties like erupted eroded. in New York, the city actually received its last completed message from Britain. And by October 28th, the Great Cable was pronounced dead. Oh, Henry no. Field, Cyrus's brother, commented that, the wonder's not Rip. that the cable failed after a month, but that it ever worked at all. News of the cable's failure caused uproar on both sides of the Atlantic. In New York, the festivities were replaced by bitter recrimination. Investors were furious. Some even accused Field and his company of fabricating the project as part of a stock market swindle. 
adding fuel to the fire. The next year, a 3,500 mile cable intended to connect the Suez Canal to Karachi also failed. So that was, I was saying that that was like the most important line. Um, The British Empire with India, like I said, uh, before the Suez Canal, you had to travel. I mean, first you you travel by boat around Africa and that took months. Um, But laying that was like, and at least when it becomes successful was so important because you know, um, eventually in the, in the 1800s, the British are going to directly rule India. They use some indirect rule through, you know, British East India Company and all that stuff. But then in the mid 19th century with the um, Sepoy Rebellion, the British put that down and then replace that indirect rule with direct rule, meaning uh, they weren't going to use intermediaries or anything like that. The Queen basically of England rules over directly. And the only way you could really have direct rule is by being able to. Um, issue out orders and commands in an efficient manner. Otherwise, it's not really that direct, right? So, yeah, this would be catastrophic um, as a failure. But, I mean, they, I think you can tell, though, they can see the potential, and it's just going to be about improving the technology and the methods. 500-mile cable intended to connect the Suez Canal to Karachi also failed, meaning no That brought down communication to, like, two more weeks. In pursuit of Field's believe, dream. For that in one. fact, it was seven years before Field could try again after waiting out the Civil War. He formed another group of investors and purchased a new cable in 1865. A better By one, then, hopefully. Cables crisscrossed the Mediterranean and the Red Sea, providing valuable experience for how to pay out the immense weight of thousands of miles of copper and iron. Also, the science of telegraphy was better understood and superior wires were available. Transmission times had dropped to eight words a two minute, a which letter. is much better than two minutes per letter that Field's first cable had managed. So in July oh, of 1865, yeah. the SS Great Eastern set out with the new cable. And if you've been following for this entire this American episode, Civil War. you won't be surprised when I tell you that predictably things went wrong again. After laying over a thousand miles of cable, it snapped, disappearing over the end snapping? of the ship. But man, Field could just sense that he was getting close and managed to gather yet more investors for another. So like, okay, when it snaps... And you can't, I don't know, immediately hook it or something. Like, what do you do? Does that just, it's just over? Like, the whole line, even if you put down a thousand miles of line, it's just gone? Like, you know, can you get down there? You know what I mean? Send some down there? Attempt in July of 1866. This time, the Great Eastern steamed across the Atlantic, the Great Cable unspooling smoothly over its stern. Civil War's over now. On July 27th, the connection between Britain and North America was reestablished, and it would remain in place and in use for the rest of the 19th century. And although his grand project was finally complete, Cyrus Field had one last marvel up his sleeve. Later that year, several ships set out toward the site where the 1865 cable had been lost. With grappling hooks on the end of heavy ropes, they trawled the bottom of the ocean two and a half miles beneath the waves. And despite astronomical odds, they found the lost cable, hauled it aboard, and it still worked. So they spliced on a fresh length of cable, and now there were two Two. telegraph lines crossing the Atlantic Ocean. Though soon there would one for fun and one for business be more <laughs> within five years, cables would reach places as remote as Japan, Hong Kong, Brazil, and Australia. Dang. For the power of the telegraph was truly was immense. Monumental. Governments could keep watch on their far flung empires. Yep. Stock markets That's why the British could be were so into by it. news of a drought in India or a particularly good mm. harvest in Virginia. Friends and family separated by thousands of miles could keep in touch, and a constant stream of news could hum along the web of wires, feeding the public's insatiable hunger to hear what was happening in every corner of the globe. Such a massive step in the history of global, like globalization. You know, I mean, first, I guess you would say with like shipping technologies where you can do cross continental travel, but like that's not as big. I feel like this is like almost like a like the legitimate like first step almost of like real globalization. It's got to be instantaneous. It's got to be accessible to the public. You know, this really is a monumental thing. Oh, like the telephone and the internet that would follow the telegraph changed the world conquering, not just distance, but time itself and people. Like I said, empires use these things to conquer territories, to have that kind of communication they used it for conquest, too, so it's not all fun and games. Actually, in my modern life, traveling needless distances and wasting time are two things that I actively try to avoid. And, you know, with great tasting, fast. Yeah. And- <laughs> all right. Okay. Final thoughts. 
Yeah, so don't underestimate the power of the tele, uh, telegraph during the Industrial Revolution. And it's 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 not a coincidence that this all the, these type of technologies, you know, uh, coincide with the greatest era of imperialism that we've seen in world history. All these things made that possible, you know, as compared to times where you didn't have nearly as much imperialism and, and direct rule and a small handful of countries, you know, that are that are conquering in Africa and Asia and um, all these places all kind of comes together. Right. And uh, yeah, you're seeing it with this, but you also see the challenges of it, but you can see the investment of it. So anyways, always fun to look at history of technology, try to put that in the context of world history. With that, you guys, we'll see you next time. Bye.